Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be looking at the sociology of education from a social problems perspective. So for our learning outcomes, we're going to look at what factors have contributed to your sex sex in school. So let's ask that question first. What factors contribute to your success in school? What do you guys think is the number one factor associated with educational attainment? Parents socioeconomic status. Again, we have to think about the equation for how we get socioeconomic status, how we get life chances. And here we can look at Weber and we can look at Bordeaux and we can apply these ideas that your education gets you job prestige, which gets you wealth, which opens up more doors to diverse forms of social and cultural capital, right? However, are there barriers to education? That first link in the puzzle. Historically, being female would block you out. It would block you out from education. It would block you out from getting a good job. It would block you out from owning property. Remember that even in modern times, a woman is more likely to be owned than to own property. Okay, so even though we've had radical shifts. So again, gender can be a huge obstacle to educational attainment problem right there. Then you look at race. There is huge disparities in educational attainment by race. What happens when you subjugate an entire class of people into the lower classes? How does that affect people? So if you stick everybody that's a minority race and you subjugate them into the lower classes and you block them from getting access to education, getting skills, getting that good job to get money and capital, again, this is how historically white Europeans have dominated society. By restricting women and by restricting minority races, only white males were competing with each other for power historically. Now, since the civil rights movement, for example, we've had social changes, but still there's massive inequality in wealth between races and genders and educational attainment and you know, job prestige, who's the CEO of what company, et cetera, okay? And so again, Think about your socioeconomic status. That's a huge factor in your success. Think about the culture that you're surrounded by. Well, how do they value education? You know, what kind of socialization have you been exposed to that's associated with whether or not you're doing well? Think about the quality of school you went to. Are they teaching you upper level skills so that when you go to college, writing a paper is easy for you because you already know how to do it. And you can just rock out algebra like it's nothing because you spent years knocking it out. Not every student has those skills coming into college. Why? Because maybe they didn't go up in a place that challenged them. Again, intelligence is associated with socioeconomic status. And again, that's a sad conversation to have, but the number one thing associated with brain growth is did you eat today? So again, kids in poverty who aren't eating as much, they're already at a huge disadvantage for educational attainment. And then think about home life. What if they're growing up in a troubled home? That's associated with things like juvenile delinquency and less educational attainment. So again, these are all areas of social problems that we can look at related to education. Um, have you also experienced problems that cause you to fall short or some of your objectives? What has blocked you? Why are community college students less likely to get a bachelor's than university students? Again, what you know, unique troubles or struggles might a community college student be facing? Do they have less socioeconomic status? Are they having to pay for their school? Are, what happens when their car breaks down? Are they having to work a full-time job and pay rent and do all of that while going to school, while a university student may have it a little bit easier because they have more support, okay? Um, we're going to be looking at major sociological perspectives and how they deal um, with education. I have a slide in the theories. We'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to look at the causes, effects, and possible solutions for these problems. How can we reduce inequality? How can we make the education system more equitable so that society is more meritocratic? And again, how does race, class, and gender affect people's educational opportunities? And again, in sociology, we're often applying these macrocosmic variables to account for phenomena. In psychology, when you're talking about education, you're going to be looking at the individual. What's going on in their head? What are their own personal struggles? What are their feelings, their emotions, their motivations? You know, uh, how are their experiences influencing the way they think? That kind of stuff. And in sociology, we're going to be looking at the bigger picture stuff like culture and race and class and gender and biological sex and identity statuses and how all these things can affect it. Okay, so... So for our theories, first, we're going to, you know, 
ask the question, whenever we're applying the theories and we're applying it to the education system here, and then we're going to relate that to social problems, you know, what are the big things we're going to ask with each theory? So for functionalist theory, the first thing we're going to ask is what's the purpose of the education system? Okay. And why is inequality built into the education system? And is that an accident, like a latent function, or is that an overt manifest function of the system? So again, when I ask my students, what's the basic purpose of the education system? Of course, you're going to be like to teach people, right? To teach you skills so that you can roll take jobs in society and then become a contributing citizen. That makes sense. So the goal of the education system is also to transmit our culture, our social norms, our way of life, our language, so that you can function in this world. And then it's also supposed to be this meritocratic system where the best and the brightest have this opportunity to shine and rise up, and then they can take the elite social positions. And again, and so as we're going to see, though, if we apply conflict theory, OK, maybe the point of the education system is to transmit culture that makes sense. Yes. And to teach you skills and all of that. But again, who has the most access to the good schools? And so here we're going to look at with conflict theory, group versus group. Groups are competing for power. So, for example, the good schools tend to be in the high tax districts. And so if you're family can't afford to pay the high taxes, then you can't afford to live in the good school districts. That's one way that we make the system, you know, unfair. Because think about it. Look at kids growing up in schools where like their towns, they don't have a lot of money. So those towns aren't kicking in a lot of money, an extra tax money toward the education system. And so all they really have is just that state or federal budget, right? But the schools in the good, wealthy areas, they get that state and federal money, but then they also have tons more tax money because they have wealthy individuals paying high property taxes. And those high property taxes, huge chunks of that go into the schools. Okay. And so if you're investing more in these schools in nicer neighborhoods, then those kids in those neighborhoods are being invested in more by society than other people meaning that those kids are developing the cultural capital, the skills, the language, the math skills, the science skills, whatever it might be, to be able to go out and compete. They're also getting the status, okay? And then other kids growing up in not as good of neighborhoods who parents can't afford to go to college. Again, the other thing that the education system does, which we are gonna talk about right here, is that it filters you into social classes. Those of you that whose parents are wealthy and you go to the good schools and you get the good jobs, you get filtered into the upper classes. Those of you that go to the tech schools or that don't go to the good schools, you get filtered into the lower class workforce. OK, so the education system, yes, it teaches you a bunch of stuff and yes, it's giving you skills. And yes, it does kind of weed out the best and the brightest so that, you know, the best and the brightest can rise up and lead us all or whatever the logic is behind it. Read functionalist theory with Talcott Parsons, et cetera. But again, the education system also filters us into rich and poor, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. By this way, it reproduces this class relationship. If you're born into money, you tend to stay into money. If you're born into poverty, you tend to stay in poverty. Yes, social mobility exists. But again, it's all about that equation. In order to get mobility, you got to get that status. You either got to get the education to get the job or at least some skills or some fame or something to be able to get the money so you can get that power to rise up the social class ladder. So essentially, the education system filters people into upper and lower classes in that by getting through this system, those of you that can get through this system get access to jobs that are blocked off from people who can't get access to it. And then if we imply symbolic interactionism, we're the ones who created this system. We're the ones who made the education system and not everyone can buy into it. Some kids just get bored. They're not meant to sit still for eight hours a day. They want to be out in the woods. They want to be running. And yet when these kids can't sit still, what do we do? Maybe we overprescribe ADHD medicine, which is a big critique in psychology with the overmedicating of kids who just can't sit still in school. But again, a big problem with that is maybe it's the education system itself is not meeting the needs of all the kids. 
So again, in there lies another social problem. Not every kid wants to be in a cubicle. Some kids want to be out in the forest and working with trees and building stuff. And, you know, the college only opens the door to really engineering. It doesn't necessarily teach you like tiling skills. You need to go to like trade school for something like that. And so, but again, which jobs pay more? The elite CEO jobs or the skills jobs with tiling? Yes, you can do well in tiling, but again, the average, you know, person without a college degree only makes about $35,000 a year. And the average person with a college degree makes about $65,000 a year. And so again, you can see how the college degree is doubling or increasing our salaries. So again, with functionalism, what's the purpose of the education system? Conflict theory, how does the education system create inequality between social classes? And then symbolic interaction system is we're the ones who built this system. We could also adjust the system. We don't have to have a system where some schools are underfunded and some schools are overfunded, but we've opened the door that, you know, in wealthy areas, they can contribute more to the schools. And by this way, those wealthy areas can pay their way into getting their kids more skills. All right. So again, when it comes to educational opportunities, there are huge disparities in race, class, and gender. In modern times, this wasn't historical because Asians, again, Chinese Exclusion Act, we made it so in the United States that anyone that was Asian wasn't even allowed to be an American. However, since the 1960s and the opening of our borders and the changing of our attitudes toward Asians and Latin Americans and things, you have seen a big influx in immigration. And, and, and then and since then, that gave Asian people a chance to really jump in and jump in on the education in ways that they were blocked out. And this is not for all Asian people. Of course, it's specifically definitely more advantageous toward Japanese and Chinese than it is to like Southeast Asians, for example. So what I'm about to say, you have to break this up into different groups. But Asians in general, 67% of Asians get a college degree, a bachelor's degree. Okay, but again, when we look at that number, remember, we got to break that down because of which Asians are we talking about people from India, China, Asia, you know, Vietnam, uh, the Philippines, whatever it might be, you have to break that down by country and you're going to see big disparities there. But in general, Asians get more degrees in modern times, whites, 40% of whites get a bachelor's, but only 20% of blacks and Hispanics get a bachelor's. And so the goal of this class is for you to be able to explain these equations. What is counting for the high levels of Asians getting degrees? Is it culture? Is it value systems? What's accounting for whites getting 40% of degrees? And then what's accounting for blacks and Hispanics only getting 20%? Is that because of immigration status? Is that because of racism and subjugation? And again, it's very complex, but that's the goal is to be thinking about all of these variables that create disparities in educational attainment by groups. And then historically, only males were really allowed to go to college in large numbers. But since the 1980s, you've seen a flip where women are getting more degrees. However, despite that, women are still not making as much money. And here you can open up Pandora's box to why. And again, you can look at sexism and those effects, bias in the workplace. But also women choose jobs that tend to be feminine, you know, if we attribute jobs, again, a whole different conversation, but and then those jobs tend to pay less. Why? Because generally women's work is devalued in great many ways. You know, like what's most important to everyone are children, but yet we pay daycare workers like what? Nothing. Teachers yet like nothing. Be at a restaurant manager of a McDonald's makes more money than the person teaching our kids, you know? And so, again, we got to balance things out. But we also live in a capitalist society. So you got to ask, what is society value? And then apply that to pay rates, okay? Uh, but just in general, some other things you can be thinking about for your, you know, final topics or the sociology of education with social problems. We can be looking at school violence and school gangs. I have a lecture on this. If you want to look at like juvenile delinquency under my juvenile delinquency lecture and gangs and schools and things along those lines. But again, violence in schools has dramatically decreased. Historically, schools were like the safest place ever. You were more likely to get shot in a restaurant than you ever were in a school. However, since about 2018, you've seen a huge increase in school shootings. And whether that's associated with mental health problems or whether that's associated with access to guns 
or whether that's associated with revenge or psychosocial phenomena of all kinds, just think about all the reasons. You have seen a huge increase in mass shootings in, at schools to the point it's up like 2000%. It's completely out of control. Um, so my Zoom just popped up a thumbs up for me doing that. That's wild. It reads my thumbs up. <laughs> Look at that. How fancy. <laughs> Fancy technology has come a long way. We can also look at things like crime. We can look at things like crime in school. There are over a million crimes in schools. I mean, when I was breaking out the statistics in that lecture for juvenile delinquency, I was shocked. And it turns out that younger teachers for like teachers that teach younger kids, I'm sorry, I didn't say it right at first, teachers that are teaching like lower levels, kindergarten, first, second, third, they experience way more violence from students and more outbursts and behavior problems than the older children too. And again, that has me asking why. Again, what's going on with these kids' families? What's going on with the culture of school? Things like that. We can look at school financing, like I've been talking about, looking at inequalities between the schools. How can we balance out that equation? Um, you've seen a large rise in voucher and charter schools to try to balance out this equation for that kids that want maybe a better opportunity to go to a better school. How can we find a way to make that happen? We could look at issues in higher education, such as the cost of higher education, or the fact that look at the numbers of education. Like, you know, are there too many people graduating college? Are there not enough people graduating college? What kind of a workforce do we need? How many college educated people should we have? Because again, if you get to the point where too many people have a college degree, then it's like almost useless. Like is an associate's degree valuable like it used to be? Like in the 1970s, an associate's degree was a gold mine, but in the modern times, do you need the bachelor's degree? Again, we have to be asking these questions. We could also be looking at affirmative action and whether that balances out the equation of sex, gender, disability status, things along those lines. And then it just got a lot of it just got repealed by the Supreme Court. So we have to be asking questions of how is this going to affect diversity in higher education, things along those lines. And of course, leading into racial and ethnic minorities and immigrant representation. Again, you have huge disparities in groups based upon our identities. And so that's another thing that you guys could be focusing on. So I'm putting up a couple other supplemental lectures that go deep into all of this. But again, this is just to introduce you to a bunch of cool ideas that we can look at um, in the sociology of education regarding social problems. And y'all have a wonderful day and thank you so much.